Chris here with another episode of the Make It Podcast, and this is an Indie Talk Week, and that means I have my good friend and co-founder with me, Nicholas Bugs. Nick, say hello. Chris, hello. How are you, man? I'm doing good. I'm doing really well. It's been excellent. quite a week. Last Friday, I was playing basketball as I do every Friday at 5.30 in the morning with a group of uh, dad bods. There you go. And <laughs> round is a shape too. Yeah. And I'm, <laughs> I'm going, I'm going hard as I do, I'll, you know, yep. and I just take a wrong step, buckle my knee. My knee goes inward, goes the wrong mm -hmm. direction. Like uh, some of those aliens you see in movies where the leg kind of bends inward and that's kind of what they're doing. Like um, I think, I think that um, I may have, well, at the moment, I thought that I like actually blew my ACL, right? Like I thought mm -hmm. like that's what happened. And uh, everyone on the court thought I was faking to get a foul call. Yeah. Been there, done that. They were like, oh. And then I stayed on the ground for a while. I was like, holy, but I was rocking back and forth. And, and they're like, are you really hurt? And then I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. Just give me a second. I got up. I played the rest of the game. And I was telling my teammates, I said, hey, man, I don't want to let this guy know I'm, I'm, I'm like blood in the water right now. The guy I'm guarding. Right, you're guarding. Yep. I cannot turn right. I cannot move to my right at all right now. They're like, okay. I was like, so you have to have my, my back. When he goes right, you pick him up. Right. So or left. Sorry, my. <laughs> yeah. And so and so, uh, sure enough, um, that happens enough times. I, I'm running up and down the court. My my ACL could be blown. I'm running up down the court. We win the game. So I'm like, all I care about is winning, right? <laughs> and I'm, I'm like, I'm one of those guys. Yeah, and the blood's running down the side of your leg, and you're just like, we yeah, did it. We did yeah, it. <laughs> yeah, things are happening, right? And, and so yeah. I normally stay in chit-chat. I was like, hey, guys, have a great weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I believe it. I, grabbed, I believe it. I grabbed my bag, headed out of there, got home. I had to hide it from the wife because she wants me to stop playing basketball because I get injured. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And like, well, it's too much risk. So yeah. I'm like hiding and like sneaking around on one foot, hiding my limp, gr like gritting my teeth and hiding my limp. Here's what I do. And so anyone out there that has an injury, they have to hide from someone. Here's my recommendation. Immediately for Advil, bag of ice. If you can get the Sonic Pebble ice, that's superior. Wow. Sonic Pebble ice. Like, just get us a bag of peas, man. You know, like this. Come on. <laughs> peas get warm too quick, bro. And then, and then, and then a knee brace. Uh, if you have the means, of course. Oh, if that's not, how you hide it. That's how you ace hide bandage. the injury. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Ace. With a knee brace. All right. Yeah, yeah. Ace, <laughs> ace bandage. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, not so tight that it cuts off your circulation, but pretty tight. All right. And right. then elevate your leg. Okay. This is how you, oh, again, this is how you're hiding the injury. I'm just, I'm, I'm right. Cute. I'm hiding. Okay, I put, right. oh, and put on long pants. Oh, oh there you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I had on, I had on long pants. I was wearing long pants all day. No one yeah. knew anything. Listen, I live in a house where people don't notice when I get a haircut. Like they're just used to me. I see. I'm not going to go as far as say they're over me mm. or they don't love me. All those things could be true, but they definitely don't notice when I get a haircut or when something changes. And no one said anything to me the first day. And then by the end of the day, they asked me to do some things and I had to come clean. I was like, I really can't do that. So did you, when you sat down on the couch mm -hmm. in the brace with the sonic pebble ice um, and you were relaxing, did you put on Zoolander? <laughs> I, I just, I'm just wondering. I'm just thinking, a man can't turn. <laughs> He's yeah, yeah, an yeah. Abby Turner, you know, <laughs> bro. It was wild because after the injury happened, I'm running on toughness and adrenaline. 
Mm. And then when I lay down, I, I was so fast to get the medicine and compress it that um, I didn't feel it. Yeah. And remember, I'm tired because it's 530 in the morning. Like, and now it's seven or something, seven 30. So I'm still sleepy. So I just go to sleep for a little bit. So, so real quick. So I'm just trying to get the, get the you know, the crux of this real quick. So what okay. you're trying to tell us is that you are here today mm. having this conversation with me, yeah. despite having gone through such a tumultuous time. Yes. Not only the injury, but having to hide it from your own family, Chris, Cheers to you, man. Yeah. You know what I'm saying, right? Yeah. For you no, to but have gone through such <laughs> such a time and still be here with us. I'm sorry. That is that's beautiful. I love it. You asked me what the next day. <laughs> what did you ask me? Do you remember what you well, texted me? No, I don't what what? Well, I can't. You remember. text me, how's your knee? No, yeah. And what did I tell you? I don't remember what you said. He's like he, he's looking at I, his text right now. <laughs> I told you favored by God. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. Friday night, my leg hurt so bad, I couldn't fall asleep. And the only time I can remember a similar misery was on an eight hour red eye back from Hawaii to Atlanta. And I was beside these two people in economy who were basically making love the entire trip. So I couldn't lean on them to go to sleep. And I couldn't lean the other way. Wow. So I couldn't fall asleep because the chairs were erect. And so was he. And then, and then, <laughs> I was and like, so, hey, where's that going? I know where that's And then going. there's a couple over here where, like, there's a baby mama and a baby daddy and the mama of the baby mama. And they're fighting about the care of the baby. Eight hours. So I'm walking around, I'm standing up, I'm like, trying to meditate. I'm trying to do all these things. And I thought I was going to die. I think that plane, I think that flight took hours off my life. Anyway, I could not sleep. So I thought I've got to go to the doctor immediately. Like I rushed to the, uh, my primary care doctor right before they closed. I said, just prescribe me anything. I called the, uh, uh, the sports doctor. They put me first thing in the morning, Monday morning. I wake up um, Saturday. This is a true story. I'm not embellishing this at all for this conversation. I promise you. Okay. This I promise you. Go for it. Go for it. This, Uh, yes. Go for it. I'm having vivid dreams all night long when I finally fall asleep. And there's adventures happening. There's people I haven't seen in a long time. You know, there's Fausti and trades going on. There's all kinds of things happening in this dreamscape. And then at the end of the dreamscape, I find myself looking at myself almost, or maybe below myself, watching myself, and I'm praying. And in the dream, I prayed for healing energy. I promise this happened. And if you know me, you know I don't pray. So oh, not in the in dream, I'm doing way. that. Right. We all, when pray. I wake up, it's not in a traditional yeah, way. I'm just not a prayer. Right. <laughs> right. And when I wake up, the pain in my leg is gone. Well, I am happy to know that the primary care or whomever you went to mm-hmm. was smart enough to subscribe or to prescribe uncle nearest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm just I'm happy that they were smart enough to just, you know, take it back. You know, you put a little bit, as my dad says, between cheek and gum. And it's cheek and gum. That is <laughs> Jesse would is. say. Exactly. But a little just a little bit between cheek and gum. It'll heal what ails you, you know. So yeah. well done. Well, look, it made me get through the weekend. I canceled my appointment for Monday. I didn't think it was necessary. So fast forward to today, I do still have a little knee pain. It's swollen. I'm hoping I have a grade one MCL sprain. That's my hope. It could be worse than that, but I just didn't want any bad sort of like mojo going into some travel and going into the spring. So like I said, I survived. I'm glad to be here with you and I'm glad to hear, be here with this audience because uh, we have a lot to talk about today. Uh, we first and foremost have a guest with us. Uh, the one and only Ali Al Salah. 
if I pronounce that correctly. And um, <laughs> what's going on? And uh, we're going to talk about several things. Uh, first of all, that terrible uh, Ariana DeBose, uh, he pronounced her name a rap at the BAFTAs. That's terrible. Uh, something else happened this week that, you know, it may not be necessarily film related, but it is of like interest to me and you, which is sort of the Scott Adams um, debacle that happened this week. Yep. Uh, and then, of course, we want to hear from uh, Ali on a, a number of things, including our, our latest culture check items. Anyway, let's 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 go back to the beginning. Uh, Ali, do you want to give this audience a, a bio and quick rundown of your accolades, sir? All right. Uh, well, thanks, guys, for having me. I'm very excited to be on. Uh, yeah, Ali Alfale, writer, actor, architect, graphic designer, picked up furniture recently working in a kitchen every now and then, um, just all the creative things, uh, born in Baghdad, uh, moved here in, uh, to Nashville or immigrated here, uh, about 23 years ago, 2000. And here we are now. Yeah. Straight up in Nashville and just trying to do all things creative in any, any way I can do it. Well, welcome, man. I can't, I can't tell you how pumped I am to, to have you, uh, on the cast today. Uh, and, uh, part of our indie talk. So one of the things we're going to do this year that we haven't traditionally done is have people from the film community just join us for a regular conversation. Yeah. So we started doing this a lot recently. We started really with Jessica Anderson. I don't know if you know Jess Anderson or not, I uh, but, but she's awesome. And then, um, at the end of the year, we had a bunch of old podcast guests on and just had a blast. We said, we want to do more of that. Like that was that was a lot of fun. So I mentioned to uh, Nick that I got to have coffee with you and yeah. uh, probably talked your ear off. <laughs> no, it was a good comment. Prob- wait, 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 wait. Did you say probably? <laughs> oh, come on, bro. It like- <laughs> was a good fair share of talking between us, but the mic was passed around a little bit. <laughs> yeah, okay. Very good. Very good. Yeah, I mean, we, yeah, we, had, a, we had a good conversation, and um, I just thought, man, this is a cool dude. Cool dude, super smart super cultured, like lots of like, um, you know, lots of intellect to bring to a conversation at the same time, levity and not everybody can pull that off. So kudos. Appreciate it, man. Yeah. And no, I felt the same way. It was such a wide scope of topics we hit, which is, <laughs> yeah. I mean, nice for a yeah. morning coffee. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, absolutely. So Nick, you, you brought this up to me. And uh, maybe you want to like walk us into this a little bit, but like, cause I hadn't seen it. Right. I yep. had the link to the live stream. I was still pissy about not being able to go to the producers guild breakfast and awards uh, because of a scheduling conflict. Uh, so I was, I didn't want to watch anything live stream that was inside industry. I'm like, no, I was supposed to be at the PGA awards and the breakfast. <laughs> I was supposed to hurt. see my man, Darren Aronofsky <laughs> talk and cry yep. at this breakfast. Uh, imagine crying after you have a sausage biscuit and then, <laughs> and, and, uh, and I didn't get to do it and, and I'm sick about it. And so I didn't watch it, but you did watch it. What, what should I know? What should I know about this BAFTA, this BAFTA rap? Yeah, man, it was, Bring us uh, into this it was, it, yeah, it was interesting to say the least. Right. And I, I think it, it's, it's funny because it first showed up kind of like, you know, she's getting a lot of flack. Right. Ariana DeBose getting a lot of flack for her BAFTA rap. And, you know, at first I was thinking this is 100 percent culture check discussion. Right. Like this is going to fall into that because the way people had positioned it was they're knocking her for this rap because, you know, you've got a bunch of white people in the audience and it's the BAFTAs and Mm -hmm. they don't want rap. Right. They're uncomfortable with rap. And that was the thing is like they're trashing her because she's rapping and they are too uppity for the rap. And I was like, that's messed up. Right. Mm, and they're yeah. really good about how they show the camera angles. Right. They're, they're, they're kind of showing people kind of like, you know, they got that face like, oh, you know, what's this? But then you listen to the rap and you're like, oh, now I know why they're cutting their eye at this. I mean, I'm like, look, you're at the BAFTAs, right? You're an award winning actress. You are on a, a stage of elite creatives yeah and i'm listening to this rap and i'm like wait a second did someone's child 
write this like is this what happened so at first i'm in there i'm I'm in the camp i'm like i'm gonna go defend her like what are they talking about yeah. rap doesn't belong and then i'm like oh no like what is this <laughs> and th- and then you start to see what people were trolling her about is basically mm. the mm. the low level quality of or at least perceived quality of the rap and now you've heard it and i've heard it ali have you heard it i have missed all of this what, what was the con- Man, what was she rapping because she was she was rapping about women, you know, basically women in art, women in film and just how great they are and the wonderful things that they're doing. And she was calling out different actresses, you know, for the roles that they've played and just her utmost respect for them as creatives. So it was an ode to these women, mm-hmm. which was great. And I will tell you that the BAFTA folks, you know, everybody there, all the actor actresses who, that, you know, she called out were very thankful, very grateful, you know, but I will say that I'm sure they're not going to say it out loud, but I'm sure it's kind of like when you're, ah, I hate to do this. When your five-year-old daughter makes you that bead necklace at school, right? And they bring it home <laughs> and you're like, this is the most wonderful thing. It's the best. I feel like that's the reaction that they had to her afterwards. Like, don't, don't knock her creativity. Right. She's trying, you know, and that's what it was. So she got trolled because to be honest, like 100%, it was bad. Like it you, was a low do you want, quality do you wanna, rap. Do you want to hear this, Ali? I would love to hear this. Up a lady. He's in the room, supporting and leading, all here I presume. Hong Chao, Dolly D, Carrie and Carrie with the C. Day Mama, I'm so fond, and a girl, you were great and blonde. Danielle D, you broke my heart. Michelle, I've loved you from the start. Angela Bassett did the thing. Viola Davis, my woman king. Blanche K, you're a genius. And Jamie Lee, you are all of us. What's your, like, what's your favorite lyric? <laughs> <laughs> no, what's your favorite move? It's short. It's it. just, no, he saw it, but you can't even finish it because it's like that. So when she says, Angela Bassett did the thing, you yeah, know, yeah, every, yeah, yeah. see, everybody it's is kind of on that. Well, it's simple it, exactly. But, but yeah. you know, like you said, it came from a good place. Mm-hmm. So I think that's why it was such a big thing is that like, look, Y'all are a little too angry about this, mm-hmm. right? So people Y'all are trolling, trolling her. Yeah. yeah, they're trolling her on this. Like, it's a little much okay. considering the fact that it came from a, a good place. But again, what they're talking about, the, really the commentary, the social commentary is you were on this level, mm-hmm. right? So you, we expe- we as audience members, right? We as people who are watching you expect you to show up at this level, don't show up down here, mm-hmm. right? Because then all of us as audience members who really, when you look at these people, you're like, they do things I could only dream of doing. They're right, doing right. things that I aspire to do. And then when you see this, you're like, I could do better than that. Right? You don't ever want to see that, right? You don't yeah. ever want to say that in that type of audience. So anyway, it was a big deal. She got trolled. Now you can see why. But I will say that again, came from a good place and the people that she was rapping to really appreciated what she did. Well, that's good. Yeah. 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 It, it, it's true. And look, I want to tell you, I, this reminds me of something and I'm going to share it with you from my childhood. I'm old enough to remember when hip hop just started to gain prominence and just began to scare your parents a little bit. There were two phenomena growing up that scared my parents, at least two. One was hip hop and one was WWF wrestling, which has now been called WWE, right? <laughs> that ins- Those yeah, two your things that were so your parents off. <laughs> that my parents were like, they were big pushback on it, on, on both those things. And I remember playing a song in the car with my dad and it's a song where I was trying to justify the art form. Now, remember, you had a lot of like right wing people saying, oh, there's no musicality to it. Um, they're just rhyming like like it's really basic. There's no art here. 
and it's really empty, um, which reminds me of my friend's stepmom saying Whitney Houston just screams. Why does, why does everybody like her so much? Of course, she was from Mississippi. And the <laughs> it turns out she doesn't just scream. Uh, so I was like, well, let me just play this. You know, let me play this and justify the art form. And I'm loving it. You know, we're rocking. It's banging. That's how you rock. And bro. Just <laughs> my dad, my dad turns to me and says, what's so special about this? I could do this. And then he starts to say, um, I'm a big fat dog on a big wooden <laughs> log. And like, like, like rapping like her. Like, no, that's not what rap is. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> your, your idea of what rap is, is like what happens on Sesame street, but to a beat. But when you really love the genre, there's a lot of layers to it. And I think that when I watch the video, everything you said is true, Nick. But when I watch the video, I think that's what's missing. Sort of that understood cultural layer, that nuance, that if you're a fan of the genre, you understand first and foremost, and then you can, and then you can like it. Uh, reminds me of when uh, we were explaining the, the the song "Runaway" to our boy Jason, and he never knew that Kanye was rapping about himself being the asshole. And he's like, well, that- "Who's Kanye West to call anybody an asshole and too busy for asshole? He's the asshole. <laughs> he's, like- he's the asshole. I'm like, yeah, he is the asshole. He's saying that." Oh, 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 oh. Let, let me give like, you. Oh, God. You know, go, no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Like, I think it. that people just don't <laughs> listen to the context of things and don't understand how to listen to the music. No, you just reminded me of because immigrants don't understand rap, at least, you know, my parents. That's true. Well, I mean, I guess back in 2000, when we moved here, you know, rap wasn't I didn't understand. I didn't know rap until I moved to America. Just just to be clear, Middle Eastern immigrants or immigrants in general, in your opinion? I'm just generalizing my parents. Let's just say my parents. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) This is a story about my dad. Because yeah, yeah, we moved here. And, you know, at the time there's Eminem, there's 50 Cent, like early 2000s. And I remember I was so intoxicated by rap, you know, moving up here because I just had never heard something like that. And then I remember, and my dad just hated it, you know, it was on the radio. I remember Walk It Out was hot, you know, I remember he <laughs> saw Walk It Out. And I uh, and I remember having like a sit down with my dad to explain the lyrics to him and saying, like he's saying East Side Walk It Out. He's saying West Side Walk It Out. He's bringing people together here yeah. in this song. And my dad is like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> and it was just <laughs> trying to rap to him. <laughs> it was nice, doesn't know. No, but listen, you said it's immigrants and, you know, it might be just, it might just be when, when you're past it, you're past it. Like I was asking, I was asking somebody the other day, who was I speaking to? Some, it's a friend of mine. And she was, I I was asking her like, at what point do women start to buy polyester pants and get an Afro? Like at some point it happens. They just start wearing pastel pants that are polyester. Their hair stops going down their back and it starts to go up. And this is women in general. They're just like, I'm like, this is not women in general, just women, just just women in general. (laughs) They hit a certain age, their pants become polyester Mm. and they wear, they don't wear shirts anymore. They wear blouses. And then there, they have afros and it all happens. And I don't know when it happens to women. But at that point in your life, you no longer can relate to why a young woman woman might wear and say what she's wearing. And I think the same thing happens to parents and older people, uh, men, every like with new art forms. And I've, I'm guilty of it. I have no idea what the hell is going on with Kodak Black. <laughs> why do people like it? I don't know. I don't understand yeah. it. Like, like, but I've heard people say that he's a genius. I've oh, heard wow. people say it with a straight face that Kodak Black is a genius. And I'm listening for the genius. I'm trying to compare it to, to J. Cole. I'm trying to compare it to, to Kendrick. I'm trying to compare it to Eminem. I'm trying to compare it to Rakim. I'm trying to compare it to the geniuses I know. I'm trying to compare it to Jay-Z, Immortal Technique. I don't see, I don't hear it, you know? What's, the, what's that rap he, was, he did on that one podcast that's famous? 
He's Which like one. Uh, he's like Kodak Black might fuck oh, your white that, wife. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hey, hey, hey. It's like, hey, hey, it's hey like, look, what, look, look. Like, I, I get it. I get it. Like, I get it. What, look, what look, is, look, what look, is look. it? So I'm a, I'm an old man in that regard. Yeah, yeah. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, but the thing is, is that with the, so in this case again, back to Ariana Dubose. Maybe she's fire. She she tried to and do a little. She tried she tried to do a little thing. You know, what I'm saying she yeah, you know she she did the thing. She did she did the thing, and. We move on, and maybe, she maybe is now. Maybe you're a hater, and maybe no, she's I'm not, fired. No, no, and now she has been invited, I believe, to present at the Oscars. Oh, really? and, oh man! Oh, goodness. yep. You think and, she's going to reduce. We shall see. Yeah, she might. I she, don't know. you know, what I'm saying like might because she has an opportunity to talk to the haters, right? And I think she has to take because now she's become somewhat meme worthy in that mm-hmm. space, right? I mean, we're going to be that whole, you know, yeah. Angela Bassett did the thing. Multiple people have already, you know, said that over and over again as a meme thing, but people have also said it in a loving way. Like, we hear you, girl. Yeah, we're good. Like, you did did your thing. thing. Yeah, but that's, and that's what they're saying to her is that you did your thing. And, you know, Jimmy Fallon, that's the next thing for you, Ali, to check out is Mm -hmm. Jimmy Fallon covered Ariana DeBose's song on his show as Neil Young. (laughs) oh <laughs> uh, yeah so that's that okay was great. I, I'm, I'm in i'm in on that right away you're in on that so but that was <laughs> yeah. that was great so anyway to, and then half our audience a, doesn't even know who neil young is exactly <laughs> but to, to put a pin in that i think you know what look out for her on uh on the oscars then i think she will have a response back to the folks who are hating on her so I, I look forward to seeing that and again the people she was rapping to really appreciated what she did her heart was in a good place and the haters really need to shut up and stop being so angry about this it was all in love talking bro. Talk about yourself bro <laughs> yeah it was all, all in love we don't bro. understand it they it was it, fun. L- listen to your point ali i there was a song my posse's on broadway Back in the day, it's like a, maybe it was a, I can't remember. It's like a run DMC song or whatever. I was singing in the grocery store. My dad heard it turn around, smack the shit out of me. <laughs> he thought I said pussy yeah, right. on Broadway. <laughs> I was like, what, what? He's like, don't you ever say that? That's right. You got real psych the money. It's a group of friends. <laughs> don't you yeah, right, right. <laughs> ever say that? Right. And I was like, all right, right. Chris, Chris, Chris. You're right. And right, I risked right, the right. extra slap just to say, <laughs> you probably say it again. <laughs> Isn't a posse no. like a like a group of rebels or like <laughs> rebel rousers? Anyway, speaking of Oscars, they are coming up the twelfth. I know this is a little bit off schedule, but I do kind of want to know from you, Ali, like what were the best movies you saw? Who do you think is gonna win best best movie of the year? And because you're an actor, who do you think is gonna win? for best performance of the year. Yeah, man. Um, I mean, I think it's just everything everywhere all at once has been top on everyone's list. And mm-hmm. I really, what about really, your list? My list too. Yeah. That's okay. 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 Um, man, let me, I, I gotta find this bracket though. Cause I'm trying to remember all these movies. Do you, you know, gamble? That, you know, you gamble Chris is, I think Chris is going for, Oh, you gambling? Uh, for <laughs> No, but do you gamble? Do you have a bracket where you actually gamble like the you know, I winners and losers? Party every year, and then um, yeah, and then have yeah, put throw some money on it. That's <laughs> what we do. This, yeah, that's what yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We yes. Um, I don't know why we're cannibalizing each other. We got to team up. Do it. Let's make some money. Yeah, let's team up and uh, and do this together, and and then have a good time. I don't know how it's going to go over with the the, the ladies at Wift, but. Um, yeah, we'll see. Right. I think Elise dropped the uh, she dropped the uh, noms in the in the chat. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah up. But for me, yeah. like Nick said, I got I got Tar for the win. Oh yeah. And I got um, Kate Blanchett for the win. I think Kate definitely is the number one there. Now they still separate the men and the women, mm-hmm. which is fine. Male performance of the year, Nicholas. I haven't seen The Whale, but I keep hearing that. Well, I saw The Whale. It's a bummer. Well, I heard the movie was a bummer, but Brendan the movie's a, the movie's bad. good. Yeah, the movie's good, not great. Oh. And I and that hurts me saying it because that's my guy Darren Aronofsky. Mm-hmm. But it's close to great. So I'll start there. 
has a classic Aronofsky ending where the ending's really big. And Brendan Fraser is incredible. Mm-hmm. And I, it made me, it, it, it affected me the whole day after I watched it because my mother who died in 2007 was an obese lady who had similar behaviors and watching him do that to himself was rough. I'll be, I'll be real. It was, it was a rough watch for me. It's one of those movies. Like you never go and say, Hey, I'm having a party. I'm having a watch party for passion of the Christ. You guys want to come over? Mm -hmm. Like, you just need that movie one time. There are certain movies you just need one time. You don't like in the whale is a movie I would recommend, but you just need it once. You don't, you don't need to watch it again and again. So I, I'm with you. If Brandon won, it'd be a great story. That'd be the media story. You know what I mean? Cause he was kind of blackballed and shunned a little bit, but I really like, and Nick, I know what you're going to say. But give me, give me Colin Farrell, man. And they're going to say that. The yeah. of inner Sharon. <laughs> give me some Colin Farrell. Yeah. It's, um, Ali, have you seen that movie? Man? No, I, I feel like I just missed out on all of them there. No, 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 no. Th- that, that's the thing. You, you don't have to worry about it. Cause I'm in that, I'm in a similar boat. Like I don't see all of these <laughs> Oscar nominated films. Like I'm still the guy who's like, you know, I'm going to see a couple of them. Cause you know, one, I want to talk to Chris about some of them, but the other side of it is like, I want to watch a movie I want to watch. Right. I'm just not going to click on anything just because. Right. And I think that's how the majority of the viewing public is. Right. Um, So but this is one that I actually had some friends watch Banshees. Right. And they were like, hey, Nick, you're in film. We want you to watch this because we don't understand what this movie is about. (laughs) And we need you to explain it to us. So I watched it and I get it. I understand what it's about. It's very it's it's more uh, on the nose than, than people think it is. But at the same time, it's, it's similar to what Chris is saying about the whale. Would I recommend that you watch this? No, I'm not recommending it to anybody. I'm not, I'm just not. Were the performances really good? Yes, they were, but I'm gonna, I'm not gonna tell you about it. Like, I'm not gonna go and say, go watch bench. Why would I tell you to watch that? You know, like, so anyway, it's one of those where it's, um, I mean, he could get it, you know, he, uh, but did Colin Farrell do his thing? Did he? Did he, he, yeah. he, he was. Did he, he was did great. Do the thing. Everybody, yeah. everybody was great in it. Everybody. They were. They were for the roles that they were playing. Uh, but I think that when you, you know, if you kind of like juxtapose that against Tar, like was his performance as phenomenal as what we saw? No one did play? better than Kate Blanchett this year, well, man. Well, th- so that's opinion. what I'm saying. But so that's what I mean. You're kind of putting it up against like like who was at that level, and. Again, they they did well. The movie was so, but was I? Though. Yeah, but was I? Was I trying to do by Colin Farrell? It yeah, was I affected by Colin Farrell's you know performance? I can't mm. say I was affected by it. I think he did well. I'm not, yeah, not yeah, going to yeah. say the whole. And it was beautifully shot. The story was really interesting. You know, from a like it was convoluted and weird. And like you said, they try to do comedy. I think you have to be Irish. It, 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 maybe. You know, yeah. because especially, be Irish to really appreciate. especially if you're going to listen to people say fuck a thousand times, yeah. you're like, yeah, fuck in, like what? Yeah, in, exactly. yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. We, we all agree. Fuck, right? not, uh, Austin Butler. Uh, with, or, with, so, so here's, here's, here's what I'll give you with that. So, because I was going to take you to a different place, both of you, there's the people I think will win. And then there's the people right. I think deserve to win. And then there's the people that deserve to win. And I think will win. So with Tar and with um, Kate Blanchett, that's somebody who deserves to win and I think will win. Right. With Banshees and, and Colin Farrell, that's somebody who I think will win, but other people might be as deserving, like an Austin Butler from, from Elvis. Now, I'm more I'm, I'm with you, Nick, by the way. I'm in your camp of I don't just watch stuff I don't want to watch. Um you know, Papa Bear has been trying to producer Papa Bear has been trying to get me to watch this movie named Lazy Susan forever. And I just keep putting it off. He tells <laughs> right. me it's funny. I'm, I know it's yep. going to be funny. I'm going to watch it eventually. But I got, you know, I'm like, I'm not making time for Lazy Susan. So, but I will. I will. There is uh, an obligation that I have because I'm a voter to watch all these movies. So that's why I watch. Them. But here's mm-hmm. the deal. There is a movie 
that is highly polarizing named Babylon. And I think the, his name is Diego, uh, producer at least. Tell, tell me who is the lead in Babylon that's not Brad Pitt. But Diego. But he's not even nominated, right? Something. That's my point. Right, exactly. He, Diego. he might be the best actor of the year to me. He's unbelievable in this movie. Yeah. Yeah, Diego Calva. Thank you, Elise. Diego Calva. Go watch Babylon. Support this young actor, man. Like, he doesn't have a name. He carried this entire movie literally from the first frame to the last. And you have a bunch of prude people and, and actually people on the other side of the spectrum that just don't like the orgy scenes. Well, I'm here for a good orgy scene and I have no problem with it whatsoever. And it doesn't, it doesn't preclude my ability to, if that's the right wording to like, enjoy yeah. the movie. Yeah. Like I still, in the context I still got of the, the film. story. Like, I don't care like about like the, this moral thing. Like, did you tell a great story? Yes, you did. Like that movie is excellent. So yeah, Austin Butler's in there, in that group, Ali, like of like, Deserve to win, for sure. Diego Calva's in that group of deserve to win, for sure. But it feels like Colin Farrell's going to win, or Brendan Fraser. Mm -hmm. Brendan Fraser. Yeah, I think it's going to be Brendan. Yeah, so for me, I think Brendan Fraser, from a character performance perspective, like the thing that's going to make you feel something, I think it's him. Mm -hmm. Right. Like you said, you were, kinda, you were, you, you were even off put by it. You know, it's like, Oh my God, it, it what, me for the whole day, bro. The exactly. Whole day. Whereas Colin Fowl, you know, I'm like, it just, again, it was good. But, but the film not, did that I, to me. And mm-hmm. it was Brandon too. From an actor's perspective, Ali, how long would it take to put on that much prosthetics? Like how long is it here every day? Yeah. Man, it took me two hours just to do a little scar on the side of my, uh, chest that was, was, like that, this, was, this, was this, this, what movie was that for uh this was for the miss marvel series the miss marvel series yep yeah just a scar this big on my chest took two hours so i think for that you know because he had the fat suit right and everything yep. fat ankles fat yeah the feet. head and the bald and everything i mean that's got to be like yeah. six seven hour set i mean he's probably he had got like coloring three, on his ankle so it looked real where you know how the blood starts to yeah, yeah congeal or whatever that. or soak what what's the right word nick it's, it's definitely not congeal it's not soak <laughs> it's not soak no i think I'm it was sorry. just the I'm swelling and, the, and potentially the, you're like pitting and probably yeah, pitting pitting. The yeah, yeah, yeah. so yeah, yeah. It, it, i thought the makeup job was incredible in the in the yeah. but you know what the me, one cool thing about the movie that you can learn by the way if you're an indie filmmaker do go watch the whale the, I, I will tell you this okay watch the whale if you're an indie filmmaker the movie was made from a play and it was based on a play and they had basically one location. And we have a lot of filmmakers that always talk about, Hey guys, hop on this back when we were investing actively, Nick filmmakers would always come to us, right. And say, Hey, hop on this and invest in this. It's a one location shot. It's going to be, you know, inexpensive. We're going to make our money back really easy. You know, all the stuff they say. And, um, this is how you do a one location shoot. This is how you do it. Because I, because what happens in indie film a lot of times is you do get that one location, but the location was given to you maybe. And so you can't change the room and it hurts your film big time. Or you pay for the space, but you don't know how to change the room and you don't do enough to it to make us, you know, suspend our disbelief. And if you watch the well, that they did it. I mean, that house looks like the house of a, that looks like that man's house and it's really well done. And it's a, and it's a character study for, if you're an actor and it's a, and it's a set decoration design and filmmaking study. If you're a filmmaker, director, producer in indie film, period. Yeah. I mean, anything Aronofsky does is really just like a, you're really, I mean, it's a master class. You're just sitting there learning every aspect of film through his yeah. eyes, which is, and they're all kind of one watch type of movies, really. It's like you get yeah, uh, give it one. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just like, uh, uh, I couldn't watch Mother. Yeah. Mother. <laughs> I, yeah I, I'm a bit of a masochist because I, I, I will yeah, say yeah. that I have watched 
Rec Room for a Dream more than once. <laughs> and I don't know many people who can do that. That's just a downward spiral all the way. Um, I want to say I probably watched Black Swan twice. And I mm. think I watched The Wrestler twice. But the film that he did that is underrated is called The Fountain. Has anyone seen The Fountain? One of the big early ones with a, what's his name? Jack, Hugh Jackman. Demon, yeah, Hugh Jackman. Yeah. So he's basically following the love of his life through time. And, and they, they sort of, um, they've got like the, the, the tree of life or whatever. And the final scene of that is so big. It is unbelievable. It is so big. It's a lot. Like, <laughs> it's just light like, and I was, sound. Yeah, I was like, honestly, the movie didn't hit like here other movies did. But I'm here for that. I am so glad I spent this hour and a half, two hours in this theater just so I could see that shot. That was I was I lost my breath watching that shot in the theater uh, with the sound and everything. And, you know, you watch it on your computer. You're going to be like, Chris, what the hell are you talking about? But watch it in a theater. It's and this not is meant again, to be watched I'm like on my, that. I'm on my soapbox <laughs> with the theaters. Exactly, Nick. I'm, I'm, I'm on my yeah. soapbox a little bit. But yeah, go watch that kind of stuff in the theater. Man, it'll get you. And, and you can't match that feeling any other way. You know? So it'd be like watching this like latest avatar, like on your iPhone or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was dope. That was mesmerizing, man. I love that. It was. Yeah, it could, was expansive. The way yeah. I talk, told Nick Ali was that it was like um, you could see the money in every shot. Yeah, <laughs> you can you see it's how expensive yeah. the movie was in yeah. every in every shot. Yeah, for me with that film though, it's like one of the few because it's so long that it lets the story breathe. You know, like you you get to live with these people. Yeah. Right. Like you get to kind of see a little bit more before the major action that you're waiting for. Right. Happens. You get to see them live mm -hmm. and you don't get to see that in a lot of movies. So when you're sitting there watching, how long was it? Like three hours? Yeah. You don't feel like you're in there for three hours, man. You know, nah, man, like, I was crying at the end of it, man. I was like, yep. hard. <laughs> it hit like, very hard, bro. <laughs> <It's> my son. <laughs> dude, exactly. Dude, listen, listen. Not only did it did, did that part hit hard, yeah. I'm gonna tell you this. I got these little goosebumps every time I heard these two words. My Jake! <laughs> <laughs> she never calls him jake bro it's my jake and it's just, it just like no that's mine like yeah, there's yeah, yeah. just something about it it's so powerful every time she said it i was like she has this level of protectiveness right like she's just mama bear in every shape and form and it was just it was just was awesome stuff. yeah it was good very stuff, man. very henry reardon of you <laughs> Ali, can you, can you break down like uh, like your your recent filmography for the audience here, for the listeners, the viewers? Yeah, I can't I, I can't I can't reel it off myself. <laughs> I should have been prepared, but I'm not. No, no, you're no, good, no, no. Let I mean, him do it. Let him do it. I, I got you. I got you. Um, I mean, the biggest thing recently within the last year was the Miss Marvel series. So that was yep. that was a huge one for me as far as just. Okay, I mean, six months of shooting, you know, recurrent um, role. Went to Thailand um, for a couple months of those. Um, so that's the biggest one. Everything after that is really just some co-star roles here and there from, you know, Memphis and Nashville. And uh, Young Rock was, I think, the last one. Um, nice. But, yeah, most of my work really has been just the stuff I do on my own, you know, the short films. and uh, With typecast. Yeah, with Typecast and just with other collaborators. Um, Do you want to give a shout out to your to your two partners with Typecast? Type I'd love to, man. Typecast uh, with Randa Newman and Dejanay Cole. Um, yeah, it's just the three of us started this uh, little production company that could um, just promoting, uh, you know, storytellers by minorities for minorities and underrepresented voices, and uh, which has been hitting hard with um, just the production side for mainly short films right now. And then, um, the resource and education side with, uh, just writing and producing and, uh, you know, going out outreach to like, uh, schools and things like that. Uh, three or four years now. That's awesome. Who's yeah, the best actor between you, Randa and Dejanet? Oh, 
I mean, who's in the MCU is all I got to say. <laughs> right. <laughs> nice. Uh, nice. I, I love nice. it. Did you, did you hear about this uh, Scott Adams thing, by the way? Oh, man, I did not. No, I didn't hear it. So let me, no, let no, me no, just, no. for those who don't know, let me like cue it up. So Scott Adams is the creator of the comic strip Dilbert. Oh, right. That's right. I didn't hear about this. Yeah. 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 And, and Dilbert's a famous cartoon. It's great. It's been around for a while and it's really made, it's arguably the most successful comic in history, like in terms of just comic strip, uh, distribution all over the country, thousands and thousands of, of papers publish his comic strip, but you know, he's recently, and maybe it hasn't been so recent, but when I say recently over the last five years that I've been, uh, you know, aware of him and then listening to him on podcasts and, you know, reading his tweets and things like that, he's been, you know, he's been very opinionated. And, uh, this week he had, was it a Rasmussen poll? Rasmussen. Rasmussen. Yeah. What's the poll? What's the, what did I say? Did I say yeah, Rasputin? Yeah, it was, it was close, the Rasputin, but yeah, the Rasmussen poll. Y'all know I can't talk. Mm. So the Rasmussen, what, say it again? <laughs> Rasmussen okay. poll. Rasmussen poll, yeah. yeah. He, he, he got the results of this poll, and then he went on this rant. Now, everybody's calling it a racist rant, right. and I'm not going to yeah. call it that. Right. Because this is a guy who was just trying to speak rationally based on results from this poll, but he didn't do his diligence. And so... What I tweeted out about it this week was Scott Adams, who's a really smart guy, could have chose a million different ways to make his point. But instead, he continues to throw Molotov cocktails through his own windows. Mm -hmm. Right. He found the most inflammatory and most, I would say, easiest way to be misunderstood language possible to make his point that if half of black Americans and now this is the data he didn't do his due diligence on basically what he extrapolated from the, from the study and the research is that half of black Americans uh, don't think it's okay to be white. Is that, is that about right, Nick? Yeah. So oh, yeah, I think it's funny. Yeah. That was the, that was the part that was just, you know, for me, I'm a data guy, right? I'm a statistics guy. Right. So when I hear some foolishness like this, it's like, wait a second, what poll did half of black America take? <laughs> you know, I didn't take the poll. I guess I was in the other half, you know what I'm saying? So, so, <laughs> so he, he's like half of black people. And I'm like, what? You know, don't think it's okay to be white. And he's like, I'm just look, I'm just quoting the poll. I'm yeah. just quoting the poll. Yeah, it was like yeah. 56%. Right? It was a little over too. Yeah, yeah, I'm just quoting the poll. So then I so you know, I guess I'm a data person, I'm a facts person. So I go look at this poll, and the poll polled 1,000 American adults. Okay, (laughs) 1,000 American adults. So I'm sitting here like, well, this guy must have some more data than I know about because I just see the 1,000, you know, American. So obviously, he has the breakdown. Right. That I don't have access to because I don't pay Rasmussen. Right. So he has the breakdown of how many folks were African-American that were in this pool. Right. So I'm just like, okay, so let's say that half of the people they polled were African-American. So that's 500. So now you just still have a a body of only 500 people. And you're going to tell me that these 500 people can speak for all of black people. (laughs) Are you serious? And then wait, wait, wait. The question is, the question was, do you agree or disagree with the statement, it's okay to be white? That was what the poll was. Okay. And there was a second question in the poll that he didn't talk about, which was, can black people be racist? We won't talk about that. Put that to the side. So the first one is, it's okay to be white. So apparently, and I'm going to get my number slightly off, right? I don't have it in front of me. I think, you know, at least might have to bring it up if she can find it. But basically the idea is that 27% of black respondents responded by saying that they disagree with the statement. Okay. Mm. And then you had another 22% of black respondents um, agree, I believe it was, No, no. The 22 said, I don't know. Okay. Okay. So you got 27 disagree 
with the statement, it's okay to be white, 22% say, I don't know. And then you have the rest of the people agree and say it's okay. Okay, so now if you add up your 27 and your 22, you get 49. He just lumped all those people together. He lumped the people who said, <laughs> I disagree, and the people I don't know, and said, half of black people don't think it's okay to be white. I'm like, man, bro, the math doesn't even add up, right? A better sound bite, anyway. <laughs> It, what a sound bite, right? And the thing is, is that here, here's, I don't care about this guy. He had the same logic on his sound bite, Ali, that Kanye had when he said he was going to go DEFCON 3 oh, yeah. on Jewish people. people. Yeah. But he, listen, listen. At the time, he thought he thought it was a great idea. He's like, this is going to slap right here. Yeah, yeah. But this, this is going to slap I don't, us I don't I'm care go about 3. this guy. I don't. Yeah. Okay. The whole so you don't, reason you don't we're having this conversation. No, no, no. The whole reason we're having this conversation is because I think think that there's a bigger issue at play here mm -hmm. two issues one of them is people quoting these polls like they're legitimate things yeah it's okay terrible. and then the second thing is is that we as consumers see a scott adams and see his stature right i mean dilbert like chris said is famous <laughs> i mean this is like a 20 30 year run with dilbert you know dilbert is probably the predecessor to office space right and the office it is one of these things that is just, it, it's huge, right? So you look at a person like that and you say a person of this stature, a person who's done so much, they must know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. And they have a poll that they're quoting. So they must know what they're talking about. And I think that that's the danger. So for me, that's the reason I'm talking about it here for this, in this community that's going to be listening is like, be careful of this foolishness. When you hear any poll show up and then have this kind of divisive language associated with it, man, either dismiss it outright or do your research. Well, and he Chris gave a knows. solution too afterwards, right? He was like, it, oh, uh, yes, he, he did. He was like, that's and that's why I moved out from black neighborhoods, uh, yeah. a neighborhood that has a very yep. little black population. And that's what everybody's right. doing, yeah. And it, exactly, like, he said, move away from them. Yeah. Get away from them. Get away from them based off. I of hated that language. Yeah. It, well, it's, it's, it was, I'm saying, I don't want to go into it. I don't even want to talk about them. You know what I'm saying? He, it, he is not the problem. The problem is this penchant to grab a hold of a poll or to accept the results of a quote unquote poll as somehow being statistically significant and fact, right? So I can just say it is a fact that half of black people <laughs> do not disagree with the idea that it's okay to be white. That's, that's ridiculous. So that's what I'm saying. So for people out there, that's the thing. Stop listening to this poll foolishness. As Chris knows, I'm a big soccer fan. I'm a big soccer player. And during the World Cup, there was a poll that was done in Portugal by some Portuguese paper that polled Portuguese and said, hey, do you think Ronaldo <laughs> should be benched during the next game? And the majority of the people who responded to the poll said, yes, bench him. And what did they do? They benched Ronaldo during the next game. Right, yeah. And what happened to Portugal after that game? They won that game, but what happened to them in the next one? They got beat, and they didn't put Ronaldo in. Ronaldo had all the chances at the end of the game. Just what are we doing with this? But why? And here's the thing. Who in this world has the most Instagram followers of anyone else in this world? It is Cristiano Ronaldo. So you're going to tell me <laughs> that all these Portuguese people said bench our hero, bench our superhero, bench our mini god. Come on, man. Forget that poll. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's <laughs> nonsense. So, anyway, that's my thing. It's just beware of these polls. Don't get sucked into them and forget Scott Adams. There's a book that talks about this, guys. And if, if I can remember the name of it, I'll, I'll put it in the show notes or, or ask Elise to do it. But it talks about. It's not called Bad Science. I can't remember the name of it, but it's this great book that breaks down how easy it is to be fooled by studies like this, surveys like this, or just like pop culture science news where it says blah, blah, blah percent of Americans this, or you have a more likely chance of getting this. Uh, someone shared one with me the other day. It was like... Uh, uh, that one of these sugar substitutes increases your chance for stroke. That's a really dangerous article because to, to a lay person, they say, well, I'm not going to chew any gum anymore that has that in it because it's likely to give me a stroke. 
when that's not really what the study says at all. And that, and, and, and was the study peer reviewed? Was it double blind? Was it, you see what I mean? And so a lot of these things are like literally funded and you get these like sort of middling results or, or you get a headline that can come out of a result that's used to get clicks, but that's not what the study or this says at all. And, and so, um, it's, it's a shame because a lot of modern media will sell a story that way. And headline writers will sell a story that way without telling you, Oh, uh, you need a truckload of that stuff to give you, like you need a literal truckload of that liquid down your throat in order fake sugar down your throat to have a stroke. Uh, it's, it's, it, it gets like that. Yeah. Um, that's what I just, just stay, just stay away just, from it. Like I said, just I, do, I just, I say, just do your diligence in that. Yeah. Or just, like I said, or dismiss most of them outright. That's what I say. Just, especially as it shows up on someone's YouTube and the Twitter yeah. verse. It's like, and, just, and if you're Scott Adams, it. if you're Scott Adams, like maybe there's a bigger agenda at play, you know, like, I, I don't know. I don't know how this is possible because if you followed him, like I have for a while, you know, he's, he's a little, he is inflammatory, but maybe he's just smart with comics and he's not smart with life, you know, but, but if he is smart with life, then he has to have some sort of reason for like, like who are his, who's, who's gassing him? Who's his advisor? Yeah, like, who's that, helping look, man, him? look, this, what I'm telling you, forget this guy, forget this guy. Like I, we move on from this topic. Cause I got, I got something I want to ask Ali real quick. So you got this thing called typecast. Yeah. Right. And you got these folks together that are of, you know, a BIPOC, right? Black and indigenous people of color, right? You have different voices. BIPOC, different, sure. yeah, yeah, there you go. You got these different folks coming together. And this thing that I've, I've been thinking about with, um, you know, Angela Bassett did her thing. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about <laughs> folks like her and like, you know, Viola Davis and all these other folks. If you go, and, you know, because they have like the NAACP Image Awards, right? And they're going to win everything over there, Right. And I wonder, and I was having this conversation actually with my in-laws and I was like, I don't think people think about this, but I believe that it's true that you have a subconscious, um, awareness, I guess you could say that movies like black Panther, woman King, those are black movies. Mm. Okay. But what is Banshees of in the Sharon? It's not a white movie, but it's got all white people in it, right? So why isn't, why aren't these black women, black men, whatever, who are doing these black movies, getting the accolades in these other areas, Oscars, BAFTAs, what have you. And I told him, I was like, it's because they're making black movies <laughs> and the Oscars and the BAFTAs are not interested in black movies. They're interested in movies. Right. But it, what kind of, Black Panther is part of the MCU. It's not a black movie. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's yeah. not, but what I'm so when you when I'm talking about typecasting, you know, and you think about that, I think about that, the nature of that, like, is it OK enough to live in the typecast lane of ethnicity, of ethnic work? And then just to be, is it okay to be satisfied? Like, should Angela Bassett and Viola Davis, should they be satisfied with their NAACP image award? Or should they be upset that they're not on the other stages of the BAFTAs and the Oscars getting their flowers there? Like, what are your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, man, that's interesting. Cause I mean, it's like, yeah, it's funny. The high mark is, I guess the white movie that is colorless and yep. we don't call it that, but we had this exact same conversation when we started typecast because typecast wasn't the production company first. It was our TV show that we wrote and uh, produced and Web shot series, yeah. the series. And yeah. we had this conversation where we don't want to make it a black show or an Asian show or an Arab show because that will keep it in its lane. And that's all it's going to be seen as. That's right. And so we tried to find the irony in calling it typecast, but make it about three different cultures, but also represent them not as token cultures of their own thing. So it wouldn't be, Oh, this is Ali as an Arab and he's only, you know, 
whatever, talking to Arabs and for this audience. Um, and that, I mean, when you compare it to something like, yeah, like Black Panther or the Woman King, and it's, I mean, I guess it, it has to do with just the, the, like the majority of casting, which is weird to think about and be like, oh, because it's above 50% black actors now it's a black movie and well, like, think about typecast right so now yeah. where the typecast live like if you think about it in that mindset you're trying not to make it that yeah but doesn't it become that because it is above 50 percent color right, right, right yeah i mean our, our way around it was to say and this is how we would pitch it is that it was about white people problems and so it was about oh well okay if uh you know having heartbreak is a white people problem. It doesn't have to be a black problem or whatever um, rooted in that story. It could be about anybody uh, to have heartbreak or lose their job or whatever it is. And I think we got away with it because it was, we chose three different lanes. And so you couldn't really split the difference between them, but man, cause I, it's but making it me think your of film like crazy. BIPOC, huh? <laughs> but it makes it, but it makes it a BIPOC thing. Like you said, crazy. Rich, it is. It makes Asian. it a BIPOC thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not just a thing. It's not just a movie. It's it, like yeah. Papa Bear. Yeah, it's like Papa Bear asking, was Coda a white film? And it's like, and that's the thing. No. Was Tara a white film? No. Was The Whale a white film? No. These are just films. What I'm saying is that I think that there's an unfair stigma that's attached when the majority of the cast is black or Asian, right? Well, even when, when, Crazy Rich uh, Asians was can even I, can seen I still man this as an Asian film. Go for it, man. Can I still man this? Because I'll take the other side, which is, are they talking about the cast or the audience? Because if I, I ask think it a might black be a person, is Tar a white film or a black film? They'll say, what is Tar? Because they they're not even aware of it. Because that's mm -hmm. not for black people. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about. Well, oh, the, <laughs> it's a, it's a, I'm being real. I'm being well, that's real. It. Like, there you go. It, it, it's, about a, it's, about, it. it's about a composer, mm -hmm. a classical composer. And and her downfall basically, and and her way back up, and that's just not a black audience that's going to watch that. Statistically, are there black people that like classical music? Well, you're looking at one. Mm -hmm. you're looking at but two, right? <laughs> you're looking at two. But do we represent? Do we represent the film going audience? My guess is that if they did demographic, which I know they do demographics uh, on the audience or demographic research on the audience of tar, they're going to find that 99% of them are white. So, so and talk if you about find, and if you quick, find uh, demographic content on how many people watched uh, the, uh, the woman King or yeah, so, so talk Black about Panther, that when it comes to the awards, black, 60% so talk about yeah, that I mean, when it comes to the When does it awards, ele though? get elevated to that status of colorlessness? Like when does yeah the woman King become that movie for everybody and not, just for black it should people. have been. I've, yeah. I've said on this podcast at least three times, the Woman King was incredible. It was incredible. Right. The oh, yeah. performances we, we were it. incredible. Yeah, we it, get everybody, it. Everybody, everybody could enjoy it. There was no language in it also that was sort of, um, you know, sometimes on a quote unquote black movie, you have extremely sort of pro black language and culture or that just cultural white people can't relate to. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like there's a creeds coming up, for example, creeds going to get a mixed audience fast and furious. The next one's coming up in, in late spring. It's going to get a mixed audience because they're not going to view Tyrese and ludicrous and Vin Diesel as black and, 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 uh, was it Michelle Rodriguez? They're not going to, yeah. As, as a Hispanic and, and think they're not going to, yeah, yeah, they're going to view it as a story about cars and this adventure and family. And and it's going to get a great, it started with Paul Walker as the, the main guy. As the lead. So, so that it's going exactly. to get a mixed audience. And so yep. just to still man, it doesn't mean I agree with this. I'm just saying to still man, it, cause I can see what your y'all's point are about cast, but it's also about the anticipated audience, which is related to the dollars that the movie's going to make. And that's all the industry cares about, especially at the studio level at there, any level. I, I don't want to, I don't even want to demonize studios. Everybody wants to make money off their movie. So like parasite was a study case in that. Cause that when that came out and that, I mean, I don't think anyone saw parasite and said, that's an Asian movie. Yeah. Like I that, love parasite. I thought it was a foreign film. 
Right, right, right. But then it got yeah, elevated you wouldn't. to an everybody film because, yep. I don't know, maybe because the quality was that great, but it was I don't know weird. how, yeah, I don't know how you get but, to that Okay, level. so here we go. That's what I'm saying is that I think that there's this a very interesting stigma, potentially, again, a subconscious bias that folks have uh, that may find its way into the BAFTAs and into the Oscars where it, it, that's that's for black people, right? Mm-hmm. And we the things that we're going to award aren't going to be so specific to one culture or one race, right? We need to elevate it. We, the things that we award are transcendent, mm-hmm. yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And I think that's the intention, but there's this, un, again, this, this unfortunate bias that's associated with those. So I'm just curious, you know, like, just in with with you, you know, with what you're doing with Typecast and maybe even other things that you're working on, you know, have you found that even getting work, you know, when you say, uh, you know, when you tell people about your descent, mm-hmm. right, do you find that you're placed into roles that they fit? Oh, we were going to make sure that we put them into a Middle Eastern role or we're going to put them oh, in a film that's highly that or 100 I mean, that's why we, yeah. yeah, that's why we started <laughs> Typecast is because me and Asian and a black girl saying, oh, we're only getting... <laughs> Arab Asian. I, I, la, two days ago, I had my first terrorist audition, like a full on <laughs> non redeemable terrorist. And I remember like having this conversation with myself six, seven years ago. And I started, I was like, when I get this, am I going to audition for this? And re- yeah. Yeah. Man, I tell you what, I did. I did re- audition. It's yeah, yeah, funny, but work, funny, bro. You know what I mean? It's like, work. Yeah. I'm laughing because it's so on the damn. Oh, I know, nose, I know, but... I know. Yeah, but that's the thing. I never got the, the baseball player, right? Or uh, or whatever lead romantic you know that was colorless is I mean for the last yeah five or six years eighty percent of my role auditions have been oh we're gonna need an immigrant we're gonna need you know That's the crazy. bouncer the thug or whatever it is and you know some of that has to do with my size or whatnot or, or my look but right a lot of no it listen 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 Ali listen listen it's sad and the reason it's sad is because you are sexy. <laughs> Look at him. He just looked at you in your <laughs> eyes when he said that. You know what I'm saying? Look, look at him. <laughs> look, you I'll are. take it. Yeah, yeah. Don't act like you don't know. Oh, I know. Come on now. He's, he's, right. he's you like, no, no, no. You're saying, you're saying you can't play a lead? You, you can't play the romantic lead? Right, right. No, I definitely know. I can't. I look at you and I say, that's a guy that can sling it. Mm-hmm. I've been slinging. That's, I'll tell you that's that. That's right. It's like he, he, he can sling it and he, get, he can wear a baseball cap while he does it. You know what I'm saying? Like, let him be you got the big, player. You got the big curly <laughs> But it all hair, starts with the writing. Wavy it's, hair. Yeah. yeah. Perfect yeah. symmetry. Your nose sits in the middle of your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> you hear me somebody hey, talking about up. here? Yeah, exactly. over here. <laughs> yeah, talking them they up. Can't, they can't be the romantic lead. No. Not in no. America. Gerard Depardieu tried it, and they and they came over to America. And said, "Hey, man, that dude's nose is over on his cheek. He <laughs> can't shoot him from one side only." Yeah, exactly. How's he having sex go. with Julia Roberts? How? Right. <laughs> Doesn't make sense. But yeah, man, that's we're, 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 and it's good to hear that you know directly from you as well because you know I I stopped acting because they wouldn't give me the white roles. Well, I was yeah. like, "What do you mean I can't be a white guy?" We. Talk- <laughs> <laughs> they gave you the Hawaiian rolls. No, I'm just there you go. <laughs> but yeah, but it's just the but like it's, right. But it's good. <laughs> it's good to hear you know that perspective from you, and yeah. it's also good to hear that you know you come together with a team of folks to you know one poke fun at it because they you know they often yeah, say that true. if you don't laugh you cry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Um, and I think that's what you're doing. You're like you know what we're gonna poke fun at this. We're gonna make we're gonna do this our own way, and. To me, I think even for for Chris, we we talk to independent creatives all the time, and it's like sometimes there is there is a lane for you. It's like the idea when we say like produce where you are. You know, a lot of people want to go to Hollywood, do all this stuff, and they don't make it. It's a, the the pond is 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 too big, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like, but you can produce where you are and be successful where you are. And I think that the same thing is true for the type of content that you might want to create, right? There might actually be a lane of. BIPOC folks who think the same way that you do, who have some of the same challenges. And if you can be successful with that audience, then be successful with that audience. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. I think that there's a lot of value in that. So there's nothing. And, and to me, it's kind of like back to some of the Kanye stuff. One of the things that always bothered me about Kanye, I'm sorry, Chris, yay. Um, but then one of the things that bothered <laughs> me about him was that he was often just saying that he wanted what they had. Yeah. Right. They have a label, you know, they've got a, um, a clothing line. I want to have a clothing line. They have a fashion show. I want a fashion show. It's always about them. 
Mm-hmm. And sometimes I feel like, well, what if you stopped chasing them and you stayed with your folks who are very interested in the type of things that you're doing, audiences that can understand you? What if you just stuck with them? Could you not be successful? Could you not be happy? And I think that that's a really good lane to really dive into. And, and you know, for us, of course, we wish you all the best in that Thank spot, you. you know, doing very well with that audience. Yeah, I mean, totally. Nowadays, I think it is possible to, I mean, definitely create your own content, create, I mean, everything I write now is, has me or an Arab or some BIPOC lead because I want to see those roles that are just, oh, this is an asshole who's falling in love. He doesn't have to be, you know, an Arab who's dealing with Islam. Like it it could just be that guy um, who lives in this world who's doing this. And the more, and, you know, I saw it with, I mean, only recently that I've been seeing this for my culture is like through Rami or uh, Master of None or recently when I'm like, okay, these, these are characters from where I come from. They're dealing with problems that have nothing to do with what I used to see, um, you know, with terrorism or things like that. Um, And that's where it's moving towards. And I love it. And I love being a part of that sort of grassroots ish, at least in Nashville. Um, yep. Yeah. But, awesome. Yeah. How do people get a hold of you? Like if they wanted to see your stuff, if they wanted to be a part of what you're doing, yeah, man. how does that uh, work? I mean, just typecastpictures.com is, uh, is where we got our stuff and you can always send us a message there. We're always putting out, um, we've got, I've got a writing workshop next or in April that I'm doing for anyone that wants to get into writing and, uh, we'll do, you know, writing competitions and short film competitions, you know, then anybody that wants to work on production or has an idea, reach out to us and, you know, we'll throw it on the list. <laughs> Got a lot of them. Awesome. Us here. Yeah. That's super, super exciting. I, lo- I love that. Uh, I think we should drop right into culture check. Oh, geez. Yeah. Why well, we do it again? Culture check. We're going to, again, <laughs> we're going to, we're going to pull that sound. I'm going to get, yeah. I'm going to load that up and we'll just have that as like a sound bite. Culture yeah, check. we'll have to. Culture that's check. that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So let, let me, let me jump in. You want to, you want to take yeah, a frame this culture check up for us, bro. All right. So I watch a lot of television shows from when I was younger, right? So the nineties and the two thousands, I have my family watch those shows. Right. So we don't watch a lot of the stuff that's out now. I think, especially for my kids, they're younger. I got to be careful about what they watch. So I think about, well, what did I grow up on? Right. Grew up on things like Family Matters, Full House, Fresh Prince, you know, also things like Modern Family. Like you have all these types of shows. Right. Mm -hmm. And as you, as I've been watching them, I see things that would get caught up today in the hashtags and the me too's and all the things, right? When I hear Will Smith, right. Talk about uncle Phil and how fat he is in Mm -hmm. every episode. I question, I'm like, would that fly? Like, could you do that now? Could you still be on uncle Phil and how fat he is? Or is that fat shaming? I was watching modern family and man, I, I cracked up so hard so you got, um, you know, the, the, the white you know, guy marries the, the Hispanic woman, you know, and you got the, the gay couple and you got all this and you got the, the, the white guy and he's, you know, he's got his, you know, Hispanics, what, um, stepson, right. And his Hispanic stepson says to him, he's like, Hey, you're going to go golfing. He's like, yeah. He's like, can I go with you? And he goes, yeah, I was probably going to have a you know young Latino kid carry my <laughs> my clubs anyway, so you might as well come. <laughs> and you're like, yo, <laughs> like, that's jacked up. <laughs> but it's so funny, you know? It's like, yeah. it's, you know, and I just wonder, like, in today's zeitgeist, when you don't have Latinos anymore, you're supposed to have Latin X, right? And there's all of this scrutiny on every last thing that you say, especially when it comes to comedy. Can we do this anymore? Can we have this kind of this kind of comedy in 2023? Or are you just waiting for somebody to come in and be like, I can't believe you said that, and then try to cancel all your stuff? Before so basically, you this, Ali, before you yeah. answer this, Ali, I think Nick framed this incorrectly in several areas. <laughs> and it just goes to show, and it just goes to show that my assessment of why he loves modern family is so accurate which is that 
it's a, it's not close to reality, right? Like skinny gay guy in a relationship with a fat gay guy. My business mentor is gay. No, it didn't work that way. You got to have two fit gay guys in a relationship. That's how it almost always works. And you said white guy and Hispanic. It's old guy and Sofia Guevara. Yeah, Vergara. Yes. Yeah, yeah, but That's that wasn't the, the point. The problem is but not that, white that guy. Was, but that wasn't the point. That was it's the old point. Ed O'Neill. Yeah, but it was the point. Sofia Vergara. <laughs> He got it all up in his throat. Okay. <laughs> that's the problem with the show. The show doesn't no, no, mirror no. reality. No, no, no. I'm not worried about that. I'm not anyway, worried about that. I'm not worried about that. What's wanted, funny is that. I just wanted to, yeah, I just wanted I, to say that. I'll go ahead. What's funny is that it's called Modern Family, and we're already thinking it's outdated. You know, because that was the yeah, premise yeah. was that this is oh, a well, family you that a was. culture check on. <laughs> that's <there>. right. <laughs> culture <laughs> check. <laughs> I think the way, I mean, what you were talking about, it reminded me is. I yep. think the way, I mean, if anything, it's going to be in the comedy world where we start, we have these, uh, these jokes or whatever, these premises, but I always think of like the show, like Atlanta, um, where yep. it's that to me is where the direction of humor goes. Cause they've got a lot of racial jokes and it's spot on and it's hilarious. And I think it's touched on in a clever way. And that to me is where I would see those sor- sorts of, uh, topics approach. But yeah, I think when you're talking about sitcom where it's just, you know, zingers here and there. And, you know, it's just, fu- it's just funny jokes is all that, all it is. And I think that's what, you know, the conversations with like Seth Rogen or people who built their entire empires on these types of movies that can, you know, like sort of hanging fruit type of jokes, you know, they're, they're the ones that are like, all right, can we have these, can we make these movies anymore? Where are people too sensitive? I, I don't know. I feel like if you, I mean, I'm just a fan of where Atlanta's heading or Rami or Mo or things like that. Yeah. And I just don't, I don't think you could do sitcoms. Yeah. Like modern family anymore. I mean, you know, the office got away with a ton of stuff just because yep, yeah. the character right. himself, Michael Scott was an idiot. And so I think it can play off like that and where it's like the foil, but man, I think if you take it too seriously, it'll get too serious. <laughs> and I, th- I think that's it. I think they're just yeah. taking it too seriously. It's like, you yeah. can't, just be funny and you know chris and i talked about this before about you know in black culture versus you know black culture versus white culture is the idea of you know teasing people playing Mm -hmm. the dozens right this whole idea is like you're just you're not doing it to be for the purpose of hurting someone's feelings right the whole thing is just to make fun Mm -hmm. right and you kind of give it you give and take and i think that's what sitcoms always did like you might have been the brunt of a joke, but you turned it back around on someone else. I don't think I've ever seen a sitcom where there's one person who gets picked on throughout and doesn't get their opportunity to be the one who picks on somebody else. You know what I'm saying? Like it's mm-hmm. your uppins will come and it does. This is bad because, writing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Cause everybody has their flaw, right? Everyone has that thing that can be picked on for whatever reason. And you just let the sitcom roll and everybody gets it. Right. So never, so that was for me, why it was okay. It was like, no one is really being singled out for anything. Everyone gets it. And it's funny because everybody gets something. Someone's going to get joked on for something, but yeah, I, I think well, I, I see where you go. So like Atlanta. This, yeah. Go ahead. No, I was gonna say with Atlanta, I feel like the, the comedy is there one to be funny, but also to your point, it's, it's almost like a social commentary mm-hmm. versus just like you said, kind of low hanging fruit. Ah, uh, you got me kind of thing, but there's a more social commentary. So we're seeing if you want to tell those t- types of jokes, then you have to do it in a socially conscious kind of way, which is really interesting. Yeah. I mean, now I'm thinking of like family guy, I feel like family guy is still doing those jokes to this day. And I mean, they're not getting canceled. No one's talking South about Park. Kansas or South Park. Yeah, yeah, South yeah. Park and even the Simpsons, but those yeah. are all animated. Right. Is right. there something different, right? That some, they get a pass, you know, is that. I, I think that's, I think that's a great point, Nick, is that it's who tells the joke now, right? Like to, to Ollie's point, like, yeah, Seth Rogen might be feeling it because like he might be a person who people aren't willing to allow to, to tell that joke anymore. Right. But if you're animated, like what they did with Harry and Megan was hilarious. South Park. That was great. Great. And they, you, and they understand the power of, of using a cartoon to make their point. Yep. 
politically, socially, whatever. I think Family Guy has done the same thing for a really long time. Atlanta can 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 continue to do it uh, in this zeitgeist uh, as well. And to me, it's who's telling the joke and was the joke funny? Those are the two elements. So when a joke is insensitive but also not funny, it's bound to offend. But if you can just say, like, flat out, that was funny, sorry, I know they're wrong. The response you get is, oh, they're wrong for that. They're wrong. For that. Yeah, right, right, right. right? <laughs> because it's offensive, but it's it's so funny that we're going to let you get away with that offense because you, at least you put some good writing and craft around your joke, right? Man. Like So that's the thing. Growing up, you know, I post 9-11, I got a ton of, like, terrorist jokes, bomb jokes, and things like that. And I realized... I mean, and you know, I, people are stupid, right? Right. But like, I realized from early on, I was like, all right, I got to find the comedy in this instead of turning around and, you know, fight back or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So I got to a point where I was like, all right, if you're going to be racist, at least be funny, at least make me laugh. Let me hear a joke that I haven't heard before. And then it'll be quote unquote. Okay. Um, Cause you know, I just didn't take it that serious, but this makes me think of at least devil's advocate wise, you know, because you were saying, you know, with black culture, you like teasing. Same with Arab culture. Like, if you're going to tease and take it and sell it, then it sort of makes everything okay. We all know that it's not serious. Is this sort of an overcorrectness from, like, white majority to where, you know, I can see an Arab joke on screen, and if it's funny, I'm going to laugh. Like, it'll never get to me to a point where I'm like, oh, man, you can't be making those jokes no more. Like, and I don't know if it's the same for you guys, but, and I'm sure there's, you know, there's obviously a line somewhere. But is it sort of a the voice of, you know, woke people at this point to where and specifically white woke people to where it's like, oh, we're trying to um, fight for the minorities by sort of feeling bad about this joke. Is that anyway a thing? It, it might be. I think that there's it's, it's weird because it, you can't you probably can't pinpoint the one thing. Mm. So I would agree that it could be white woke but it could be also um, woke, period, right? So, for example, forget the, the black jokes, right? Forget the, the ethnic, ethnic jokes or jokes about ethnicity. And let's talk about weight, mm -hmm. okay? So I don't think that there's a disproportionate number of white woke folks who are saying you can't make fat jokes, but you have people in the zeitgeist right now, like Lizzo, Right. Lizzo is doing her thing. <laughs> you, you got that. <laughs> so and she's she's a star and she is a speaker box for people who need to be happy and to feel safe and to be proud about who they are at whatever point in time that they exist. Right. If you are big bone now and then later on you lose some weight and you're that whatever you are, you should be proud of it. And you should not allow anyone under any circumstance to say or do anything that undermines your beauty, your uniqueness, and your place in the world. So that's where the jokes come in, right? Mm -hmm. Is that people feel hurt because they feel as though those jokes are attacks on their beauty, on their uniqueness, on their special, you know, how the special they are in the world. And I think that's what's happening. It's like, there's almost, and, and this isn't everybody, right? This is, again, this is not one of those and, polls and I, where I can say 50% of Americans feel this way. <laughs> and, and right? I, but, I think that was happening. <laughs> like in the nineties was terrible for it. I think you had 50% of the jokes that were funny and appropriate if they were fat jokes and another 50% were just straight up attacks. Just like I, I look back to the you Super Bowl. D.L. Hughley. D.L. Hughley. Yeah. But <laughs> I got some thoughts on D.L. But look, yeah. in, in general, cause I, I think he, yeah. he, he profits off spreading hate and division yeah. these days. Uh, but when I met him in person, he was very nice. And that was years ago though. But, but here's the deal. We grew up in a time where, you know, that was kind of okay. And it showed its face recently at the end of the super bowl. When the chiefs won the super bowl, their coach is Andy Reid. He's a pretty big dude. Mm -hmm. And you had Terry Bradshaw, who's from another generation said, well, he's, um, he's, the guy that's hosting the post game celebration and handing out the trophy and announcing the MVP. And he says to Andy Reed in his big moment, waddle over here. Now 
That's well, disrespectful to me because yeah. he just won the Super Bowl. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and, yeah, he's a big dude. But you can't say on national television while 100 million people are watching, waddle over here and talk to me. Yeah, but you wouldn't know, have said waddle over here to somebody not fat. No, but they it's probably so, have a relationship we don't even know about. Like I, some of that man, stuff is I, like I, I, you hope, know, I hope so, but it's still not appropriate I, on that stage. I, I, on that stage, but he, yeah. you know, I'm I'm sorry, but I'm gonna give him a pass because when you're in the boys' club like that, they probably forget themselves. Like this is my buddy, you know. And he's <laughs> like, but he's like, he's my buddy. Why don't your little butt over here? Like, come on. Like. I, I I assume that was what happened. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You didn't make so it. I, I you didn't make it professional. Pass. No, I didn't say it was professional because he's talking to his like, boy. Like they're never, they're never <laughs> having Terry up there again. So that's no, the word of the street. They're never having. He's never doing it again. Yeah, he's gonna get canceled it, because it, it, he told his boy to waddle over here. No, he's not gonna get canceled because the world lost <laughs> Terry Bradshaw. Right. Because right. all the NFL fans are 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 you know they're between thirty five and seventy five and they remember Terry Bradshaw winning those four Super Bowls and ninety nine percent of them are not and, woke. I got a survey that says it. Yeah, yeah, and <laughs> he's not gonna get canceled. Like he's he's he he pulls ratings for Fox Sports. That's right. And it's like, okay, you told the man to waddle over here. And then when he won, you said, go have that cheeseburger. Damn. Go get maybe, that's a, cheeseburger. maybe that's an inside joke. Bro. And, maybe it he was probably, like, and it probably yeah, and is. Maybe he wants to go to Disney. Disney. Super Bowl gets an international audience. Yeah, he just wants to get international audience. I mean, I think that's a there's, there's, a there's a kid in Germany that just doesn't understand. There's somebody watching in London that's like, why does he keep, like, pressing this man on the fat jokes at, at the end of a football game? It's not a movie. It's not a comedy. They're not doing a bit. Mm-hmm. He's literally handing handing him the biggest award you can get in his profession. It, it, it'd be like telling Aretha Franklin to waddle on over here and get your Grammy. Bro. Bro. It would be completely that, but, inappropriate. But, but, it but it's, a, it's, a it's a you different audience. Franklin's. It's a different audience. You can't tell Aretha it's, Franklin to waddle it's a different, over here. It's a and different now you audience. Your Grammy, go have your cheeseburger. Nah, it's a different audience. Go get I think cheeseburger girl. Like, a, go get like you I that said, fried chicken survey says. says girl. Survey says people who watch football on a regular basis ain't woke. So you know, <laughs> they're not worried <laughs> about well, it. I'm saying it's not even. I don't even know if it's a woke issue. It's just bad taste. And what I'm saying is, we grew up in a time where 50% of those fat jokes were in bad taste just because those fat people didn't have a voice. Yeah, well, That's again, all I'm saying. I, my my yeah. point isn't woke versus non-woke. My point is 50% of those jokes were just like, they got no voice. They can't fight back. Yeah. Well, that's that's Waddle my point about have that cheeseburger. That's my point about the quality of the sitcoms. And it was yeah. back to what Ali said about good writing. You would never let a single person be the butt of the joke the entire time. They have to get over. They have to have their own power. Even Steve Urkel had his right. own power. They could tease him as much as they wanted to. Yeah. But, you know, he came back and he was like, I'm going to be Stefan Urkel on y'all cats. And then what? Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. like a time machine. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So anyway, I think so. I think that's it. I think that it's just it's interesting to watch. And I'll just say that I'm a parent who is watching who is watching this with his kids and we're watching all of these jokes and we're going through all of this um, and they're enjoying it. They're loving it. And I think that they're not uh, inclined to think it's okay to tease other people. And I don't think they see it as putting anyone down. I think they see the levity in it, which is good. Yeah, so, you know, I, I'm all about it. I mean, there really is no more sitcom as a, which TV I hate. Show. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, yeah. And, yeah, that's the thing. And I think it is because of the writing has gotten more clever and you don't have to dumb it down for anybody. Um, because with sitcoms, it is about the one two punch and then you move on to the next joke and then you move on to the next joke. Yeah. Yeah. But like, that's a skill, like, though, bro. I, to I, do I that over and over again. again. Oh, that's, 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 for, you know, you know the, the, the show that does it for me now is, is probably Curb. Curb Your Enthusiasm mm-hmm. is probably right up there with the one or two or three funniest shows you can watch today mm-hmm. where they don't care about anything that's going on in society. Like we're going to tell these jokes mm-hmm. and I, I do like that element of it because otherwise you're kind of forced to like go back and watch reruns of other shows. You know, I'm yeah, down. Fresh Prince is still funny, man. That will, yeah, Fresh Prince is still funny. timeless. All day. Sit down and, all watch, day. and watch Seinfeld all day long. And who Yo. do they make fun of all the time on Seinfeld? Newman. <laughs> Newman. Yeah. 
Newman. Newman. Why? No, why oh, Newman. Newman. <laughs> well, Newman was also annoying. You know, that that annoying? Yeah. No. See, he had no redeemable qualities. <laughs> yeah. rem- rem- remember when they when uh, Kramer was addicted to Kenny roast Kenny Rogers roasters uh, chicken. <laughs> No. And and and, no. and so Kramer bribed Newman to go down and get him some chicken because he didn't want Jerry to know that he had gotten back on the chicken because he was addicted to it. And Jerry happened to be in the Kenny Rogers Roasters, and he saw Newman and he said, "This isn't for you." How did he know that? Because there was broccoli in the order. <laughs> All right. <laughs> he said, Newman, you wouldn't eat broccoli if it was dipped in fried and chocolate sauce. <laughs> hey, 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 but check it. <laughs> to me, check that's it. fucking hilarious. But, yeah, but Newman Newman got typecast too. <laughs> remember, how to be in fact. Yeah. remember old boy was in Jurassic Wayne Park. Knight. Yeah, he was in Jurassic Park being Newman too. So, yeah. you know, like, yeah. he, he's, a, he's a character you love to hate. You know, that was, yeah. that's, that's Newman. But look, if you catch up with Wayne Knight today, he's probably lost about 150 pounds. You wouldn't even recognize him. It's because you don't want to be Newman his whole life. Well, then mm-hmm. I can. And a lot of that is Jonah Hill. Yeah. So it's just, look, I'm still manning it, but it's an interesting conversation to have uh, for sure. But uh, anyway, Culture Check did it again. My That's friend. right. By the way, culture two weeks check. in a row, we've mentioned Steve <laughs> Urkel. Really? Hey, yeah, yeah. And, and just so you know, Uh-oh. Ali, the, the reason we mentioned it before Did y'all do is that? because there's, there's, yeah, there was a couple characters that I was called over my lifetime. And when I was younger, <laughs> you know, Steve Urkel, people would say that I might have resembled him at a time. I mean, did life. you, did you have suspenders and the glasses and everything? No, nah, man, I was just, you know, my, well, I will say this. My glasses, I used to tell everybody, my glasses touched my forehead and my cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I so. 3D glasses there. <laughs> yes, man. I can see you to the future, bro. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, today, that'd yeah. be fashion forward. You'd be like an Annie Leibovitz type of person. There oh, you man. go. Exactly. But then when yeah. no kids had glasses like mine, yes, man. I was I was Steve Urkel. And I turned around and I said, I'm going to be Stefan Urkel on y'all. And we'll see how that goes. <laughs> the little machine he invented to make himself sexy, it didn't change his personality all the way, though, because... If he was going to be a complete flip of his old self, he wouldn't have been lo- loyal to Laura as Stefan. He would have been out there getting that puss. You know? No, what I mean? no, no. That was in his head. That was in his head. Remember, he was like, basically, he, he was still him. And the whole focus was to get Laura. That was that was how he was programmed was to go get Laura. I feel like that. What <laughs> I feel like, you know. Anyway, a little machine, Stephon, bro. Stephon deserved somebody. Man, this back. Family Matters podcast is killing her. Right that's right. That's right. Hundred percent. We're gonna have Darius McCrary on here next, bro. Like, <laughs> yeah, we'll have, trip. hopefully, I think I think we actually will have him on here soon. That'll be yeah. interesting. That'll be fun. He's 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 quite a character actually in, in in real life. He's a real loose, funny guy. Anyway, gentlemen, I think we we've done a damn thing. Ali, can you tell everybody again where to reach out to you? Where to where to uh, find Typecast? And uh, what you're up to next? Uh, so typecastpictures.com is the website. That'll get you to all the links. Um, you know, uh, typecast series TV, I think is the Instagram. Um, or typecast pictures, one of those. But um, man, we're, uh, yeah, we're constantly working on projects on our own. But coming up next is going to be, I'm directing uh, a short in April that uh, I wrote for myself, about myself. <laughs> um and then yeah randa's got something she's been working on with her husband uh corby you guys met corby uh, yeah, corby's been on the show for yeah, yeah. the podcast oh yeah yeah, yeah. um and dejanay's cooking corby's the real too. deal too he's super talented oh i love that man yeah. he's a good guy um but yeah that's the thing man we've, we've got we're still trying to pitch the show out um been talking to studios and whatnot and um I'm heading out to la in a couple of weeks now to uh try to try to meet up some people but there's always something cooking, uh, so you can find us there on keep Instagram our, on on the website. Yeah, yeah we we'll definitely keep our ear to the ground for everything that you were doing, my man. And this was an absolute blast for those listening that want to know more about uh, Ali. He gave you the information. You want to know more about me and Nick? Want to reach out to us? Learn more about the Make It Podcast or even Bonsai Creative. There's lots of cool ways to do that. Real simple feedback. Contact at bonsai.film. So just drop us an email or you can find us on social media at underscore bonsai creative. 
DM us, hit us up. We answer 100% of all feedback, even if it's just a heart on your comment on Instagram. Well, we, we go through that and scrub that and make sure that happens. Um, our website, how could I forget? www.bonsai.film. And if you go there, you can find everything we do from the podcast to our branding and marketing services to our incredible bi-weekly newsletter that is uh, just crushing it right now. I love doing it with the team and I love the feedback we're getting from the readership as well. And so, uh, oh, I should say, if you want to just tell Nick, put him in its place, whatever, you can reach out to him directly at Nick at bonsai.film. Or if you just want to tell him, hey, man, those kids shouldn't have been so mean to you. Like I tell him every day, Nick at bonsai.film. We love you, Nick. And you you can reach me on Twitter (laughs) at a flame in your heart, or you can just type in Chris Barkley and I will come right up on Twitter. Twitter's where the intellectuals and the thought leaders go. So join me there. And (laughs) with that, Nick, can you leave us with the credo? Yes, I can. So yeah, for all of our filmmaking friends, family and fans out there, we say be better, be creative, be engaged. And thank you for listening. Nick, talk to you soon. Yes, sir. Ali, Ali. this was great, dude. Appreciate you guys. This was wonderful. Anytime. Let's do it again. Anytime. Peace. Thank you.